Welcome to Career Coffee Chat Live. I'm your host, Erin Urban, and I'm really excited today to share with you, hey, how you can make better decisions. And can too much information just be a little bit stressful? I'm your host again, Erin Urban. I'm welcome, and I'm looking forward to you having you on the show today. And thank you for joining us for an interesting discussion on how to avoid information overload and how to successfully navigate the flood of data coming at you every single second. Now, because I'm aware that too much information and sometimes unhelpful information, to be honest with you, can lead to stress, I've intentionally set boundaries on how much information I receive. From time to time, that means I feel a bit cut off, if you will, from the world news, for example. On the flip side, I feel much less stress and anxiety. In fact, I feel like I was being beat to death with all the negative news. After all, why spend a lot of energy on something that's outside of your control? However, I have to ask myself, is this the right approach? Am I limiting myself or my ability to make good decisions? We all have a great conversation today. So come on in, say hi, don't be shy, and tell us where you're from. I'd love to welcome you to the show. And speaking of the show, my guest, Kevin Hannigan, is an expert on database decision making. His passion is at the intersection of business, technology, learning, and psychology, which is really interesting. He believes that the world is constantly evolving and that we should always be evolving and improving ourselves in business and our personal life. Some of the questions we'll answer today are, what causes information overload? And most importantly, how can you avoid it? Also, how does a brain make decisions in the first place and how can data help you make better decisions? Now, Kevin is a chief learning officer at Click. He's helped individuals and organizations maximize the value they receive from their data for over 20 years. He's a frequent speaker and lecturer on topics including data literacy, data informed decision making, data decision intelligence, and data intelligence, and essential skills for today's workforce. And join me in a warm round of applause and welcome Kevin to the show. Great to have you on the show today. Thanks, Aaron. Pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to this one. Yeah, we're really looking forward to this conversation. We had a little bit of a hiccup as we started because LinkedIn didn't want to play. So if LinkedIn is not your platform, that's fine. You can join us on YouTube and don't hesitate to subscribe so you can be informed first of all our new live episodes with cool people like Kevin. <laughs> so, all right, let's chat about why did you decide to get so interested about the intersection of technology and psychology? Because that's fascinating to me. I don't often find, find that combination. Yeah, it is unusual, and I, I think it was, as most things, a journey that I wasn't expecting to happen. It, it just happened. So I, I'm actually a technical nerd by trade. I was computer science and math undergrad and started going out into the workforce, working on programming and things, and a couple events happened. I just realized that I'm getting overloaded, right? There's too much. I'm not making the best decisions. There's got to be ways to make decisions. but. At the same time, sometimes you need just like a jolt in the system to like shock you into thinking differently. So I have four kids and my oldest one um, is autistic and really, really smart, but typically says things. I'm like, where did that come from? What is the thought process? And so I started trying to understand more and more about like where they're coming from. And that got me into psychology. And I just had this light bulb moment. Like, it's just a different perspective. And you know what? His perspective is not wrong. Mine's not wrong. They're just different. And then when we combine them, we saw better outcomes. I'm like, this, I'm on to something. This, maybe, has anyone noticed this? Is, can we do this in work? Can we do this in life? And it just put me in this path of diversity and inclusion and, and understanding how different people have different beliefs and how you can focus those to the right outcomes. And I've been passionate about that the past decade or so. I still think there's untapped potential. People get nervous. They see so much data. They they freak out, they shut down, they make decisions. They don't realize that those decisions are not life or death. You can learn from them and you can adjust over time. And it's just been exciting to try to help educate people on, on how we can better do this. That's really exciting. That's really exciting and really fascinating about your story. And you're right. You, know, I would I would have to say that most people don't make decisions or don't think exactly the same way. Now, much of my young, young, young professional career, I thought that everybody should be just like me. You know, it was very frustrated as to why people weren't just like me because I wasn't taught otherwise. I wasn't taught that they were 
different ways of inferring, receiving, and processing information from the outside world. Just didn't occur to me. And that's not taught in any of the schools either, which sets people up for a lot of heartache, to be honest with you, when they move into the professional world, whether we're talking about neurodiverse individuals or whether we're talking about people who are just different work styles. It's all a difference in how we infer information. So that's important too. take, for example, recently, one of my coaching colleagues reached out and they, she said, hey, I need some help with some insightful questions to help this particular group of individuals, you know, move quicker to action comes out, turns out that their, their leader is one of those very what next people and very quick and impatient to action and not really appreciating the thought process that some people need to noodle on that information for a while. So I was like, it's really the problem here, getting these people to move quicker to action, or is the problem here helping the leader understand that there's different ways? Exactly. Right. <laughs> Because oftentimes, I don't know if you agree, Kevin, but I feel like individuals, teams, groups, companies lose opportunity and in great information because they're too impatient to get to the what next. Absolutely. I, and you look at the companies that do innovate and the ones that do come as to what's next, they put processes and a culture in place that, that support that. And you're still forward looking, but you learn from the current process, you, you iterate on it, you improve on it, and you're going to be exponentially better, especially when you're getting those diverse perspectives, because someone who's thinking the same as you, you're not challenging your opinion, you're not challenging your beliefs, you're basically just maybe getting more of the same, but today's world, it's not more of the same, it's that next innovation that's really going to drive the company, so I completely agree. Absolutely, because you talk a little bit about the dangers of groupthink, particularly when it comes to making data-informed decisions. Absolutely, and it, like you said, with schooling, it starts with it everything, right? It mm -hmm. starts with how we're grown, grown up. So, you you know, kids, I have four of them, as I mentioned, the one thing that I love and hate is why. That why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? It, if you think about it, it's because the kids, like their brain, it's a blank slate. They don't have any experiences, right? So they're asking why to understand but then you go into schooling and let's say you're in like middle school, junior high, and you start asking why to your teacher. Most often the teacher's like, don't, don't challenge me. I'm the teacher. You're the student. Don't talk back. It, it's seen as a negative many times, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go into the workforce and you're in your first job and you have a company where the culture is not as, you know, it's more hierarchical. And then you, you ask a question about your boss's statement and like, could you see it this way? And they're like, don't talk back to me. So we kind of forget how to be curious it's kind of taken out of us and that's really the skills that we need here to to manage the information overload and to get the diverse perspective and innovate is, is mm. be that culture but even though it starts with kids moving forward it also now starts with organizations fostering that because you can have the most curious adult if their boss is like okay here's the answer that's it move on you're going to have people that just go along with it because they fear the repercussions of of not going along with it when they should foster, hey, you have a different opinion, let's hear it. Because just like with my son, maybe it's actually better than my opinion. Most cases, in my case, his opinion was much better. It was really eye-opening to me. I got mm -hmm. value out of it. And he felt hurt. It was a win-win. Right, right. There's such, such huge value about helping people feel heard, because a lot of people don't. And if, if one is in an organization where psychological safety is not something that's prevalent, and a lot of them, that's not the case because yeah. you're absolutely right. It's this either, you know, death by group think. <laughs> that's what I call it. Uh, we don't dare, but, you know, the established exactly. norm that the either the leader or the culture or whatever, you know, wherever the team's going. And two, we also have this deep need to feel included. And there's a fear that if I present a different point of view, then I'll be ostracized from the group or excluded or looked or frowned upon. And human beings cannot deal with that very well. We just can't. So there's that fear that inhibits us. And what I had a practice of when I was in corporate was to actually have the meeting before the meeting and the meeting after the meeting. So specifically with SMEs, people who tended not to be the ones raising their hand and speaking up. Yep. The introverts too. Right. Right. The thinkers. Yes. 
because they probably, if it's a new concept just presented in the meeting, they're not going to have the aha yet. It's going to be later on the next day, maybe even later on that week because their brain needs to noodle on it for a while. There's no right or wrong way. It's just how their brain processes that information. Speaking of, you have some really interesting insights on how the brain processes information. But before we go there, I don't know if you remember how I introduced the show. I was talking a little bit about how I would set some very firm boundaries around the type of information I received, which is good because I certainly feel less stress, stress and anxiety. But on the flip side, am I doing myself a disservice? I don't think so. I think you're setting healthy boundaries. I mean, at, at the highest level, think of the brain as a, as a computer and computers can overheat. That's why they have fans always running. So we're exposed to all of this data and this information if we don't set the boundaries. And our brain is trying to filter through that and find out what's relevant, what it thinks relevant based off my beliefs. And the more and more it has to do that, the more and more tired it gets. It's this you know, cognitive load is what it's called. Mm. And when you're in that state of being overwhelmed, you tend to take shortcuts. You tend to, um, I wouldn't say sloppy, but just kind of take it as is. You're not as thorough. And the brain just gets so tired and tired and you just kind of want to stop and move on. And so setting boundaries in terms of what's appropriate to consume and what's not appropriate to consume, think of it just like, you know, exercise and diet, right? What you put in your body, mm -hmm. you, you have to set boundaries because it's impacting you downstream and you might feel foggy, you might have brain fog, you might be lethargic, you might get sick. Same thing with data, right? What's coming in, even if you don't realize if you're just vegging in front of a TV, Data is not just numbers, it's information, it's stories. Your brain's trying to process it all. It needs to time out sometimes. And so I think myself, it's a lot healthier to keep it balanced all the time by setting those boundaries than waiting till you get completely fried and burnt out because then you have to reset and it takes longer. Right, right. You're absolutely right. It takes a little bit of time to heal. And I, sometimes I'll work with people who are burned out and just have come to capacity and they cannot accept any more information. And they're really worried. They're like, is my IQ going to suffer? You know, what's going to happen? Well, temporarily you do experience when you're in burnout, a cognitive downturn. Um, it's not permanent. It's just your brain's way of putting a boundary, if you will. Yeah. You know, it, it's imposing a boundary on you saying, I'm not processing any more information. I have to heal. And you have to stop doing what you're doing. That's giving me the stress, trauma, anxiety, you know, whatever it's going on. And when burnout shifts into trauma is when you feel hopeless and like you can't impact and control on it. So that's something to keep in mind. If, if for anybody tuning in there now or later or you know listening to this on YouTube, if you feel hopeless, overwhelmed and out of control, I highly recommend you seek help right away because that is something you want to get out of that as quickly as possible, out of that feeling as quickly as possible, because that's when you can go from just burned out into long-term trauma. And yes, yeah, so you can get traumatized from your work. <laughs> you know, people don't realize it. You're like thinking only people that go overseas to fight wars get traumatized, but that's not necessarily the case. Sure. Um, you know, particularly, and these very interesting times that we're currently living in. Absolutely. What are your, what are your thoughts on that, Kevin? Yeah, it, well, it's an interesting point, right? It is I think there's sometimes a, a lack of understanding that, to your point of trauma, right? That that can happen in any setting when your brain gets overwhelmed to the point where you feel hopeless. And I, I've seen it happen a lot in work. Um, just recently with COVID, right? We've had to change our work habits. People work from home, work remotely, work differently. Anytime you're doing something different, just like, again, related to exercise, you're, you're taxing your body in a different way. It's a different muscle group. It doesn't mean you're out of shape. It's just new to you. And if, if you're doing that, well, at the same time, processing all of this information, the brain just going to say, time out. Like, I'm a really good computer, but you're, you're frying me here. So just, and you said it really well, is if you don't put the boundaries, it's going to do it for you. Um, and, and hopefully you get to that point where you can stop it before it gets to that trauma. But I, I think it's all about setting healthy balances. And one of the things that I advocate for to help with it is you, you filter what you want to take in based off of what you want to get out of it. Like what, what's your goal? Don't start with the data or the information. Like I don't necessarily watch the news 
unless I know, hey, I want to see the weather. The weather's on at 5.15. Let me go on at 5.15. That's my goal is to see, you know, how cold is it going to be today? But if I go and look for all this information, the brain's going to try to process it. I'm not necessarily going to make sense of it because a lot of it is outside of my business domain and I'm just going to get fried. And then I turn into analysis paralysis and I won't be able to make simple decisions that I used to be able to make before because I'm just overloaded. Really interesting. So I'm going to ask a maybe an odd question. Is too much knowledge consumption actually bad? This is a great question. I would say at this, you got to balance everything out. So the way, again, the brain works is it has its limits, right? Is you need to be able to take information and the brain is going to tell you or not tell you, like when the information is coming in, is this relevant and is this not relevant? And the challenge with that is how does it know what's relevant? Well, it's based off of your growing up, based off your beliefs, based off of your information. So I think in maybe if you're entering a trivia contest where you know everything that you don't really need to know, like they call it use, useless, I dating myself in cheers. There was this guy, Cliff Clavin, who always said, I know everything that I don't need to know, like the useless knowledge. I want to focus all of my brain power on the things that are going to help me drive my goals and my outcomes. So there are times that I want to learn things because it's interesting, it's entertainment, it's, it's added value there. But if I want to take in this specific knowledge, this specific information, it's going to drive me toward what I want to do in life, what I want to do with the company, what I want to do with you know my partners and with my kids mm -hmm. and balance it out. So I don't necessarily think knowledge overload is a bad thing. I mean, everyone has a growth mindset, I hope, where they realize that they can continue to learn. I'm not saying don't continue to learn, but at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily be a fan of cramming things in because as we remember back in high school, if we tried to do it, the more cramming you do, you might pass the test the next day, but you're going to forget it in two days. It's not really going to get stored in the brain. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. And one of the reasons I asked that is because what I'm seeing right now, particularly, you know, in the world around me, whether it's my friends, my colleagues, or my clients, is, and I'm an observer of people, that's what I do, um, one of the things I do, is I'm noticing that the pace of life seems to be going much quickly, whether that's we're just trying to do more in the same amount of time, could be, we're getting a lot more information thrown at us, we're going through a lot more change as well, and then people are also trying to level up. They're trying to step up. So then they're they're taking more on in addition to all that. So they have all these layers. And we're forgetting that we've been through this period of massive uncertainty, massive stress and anxiety. You know, that creates a certain a, a drain on our energy and our resources. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the term disaster fatigue. Uh -huh. A lot of people are experiencing that right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have clients who are just like, what is wrong with me? Like, I like what I do. You know, I, I enjoy my work and I'm miserable right now. I don't want to go to work. I just, I just want to do anything except work. I just want to go garden. I want to go vacation. People are like, run away, run away <laughs> from life, basically. Is that related to information overload on top of disaster fatigue what are your thoughts i absolutely think it is i mean like you said the world is you know hundreds of thousands of years ago we were like okay let's not get eaten over there that's that's our life now everything's different and, and the changes that happen in life in business the business plans we have now in business never existed a couple of years ago how my kids are growing up and what they do is completely different all this change adds to it and that's why I'm a huge believer of how you help with that. One of the remedies is I, I don't necessarily preach learning new technical skills. Like you don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to be an expert in, in Excel. What I like to educate people on is you should go back and, and double down on those. Either, some people call them soft skills. I call them forever skills like resilience, like you know, emotional intelligence like the concept of unlearning, like before we're going to learn something new, we have to remove the old mental models out of there. Um, active listening. How many 
classes have I taken on reading and writing in my life? Hundreds. How many have I taken on listening? None. But I actually use listening a lot more. And all of these things will help you be less overloaded when the technology changes, when you're getting too much data thrown at you. Um, and so I'm a huge believer, if you're going to go back to learn anything in school and upskill, start with those forever skills. Start with emotional intelligence. Start with resilience. Start with understanding how to mitigate bias, how to challenge assumptions. They're always going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned challenging assumptions a couple times, even before we uh, went live on the show today. You mentioned about you know challenging your assumptions. And basically, it sounds like what we're what you're proposing is that because if we stay in the same hypotheses, mindsets, belief structures, you know, our brain's an amazing thing. But again, all this supercomputer is, is remembering everything that you have personally experienced. So it has some inherent bias in that. And that can build up cognitive drift over time. Yeah. So challenging these beliefs that we feel like, but, you know, they're so subconscious and we don't even realize that we have them. So kind of what are your thoughts? Like, how can we, how can we be better at challenging ourselves in a healthy way? Yeah, it's a great point because I, I do, my hypothesis is that when we make decisions and there's some data in there and we use our beliefs, an overwhelmingly portion of them that end up being subpar, it's because we have the wrong assumption. We might have seen the right data, but we didn't question what the data meant. And so I'll give you a personal example and then I'll give like a business example. I, I mentioned my, my oldest son earlier. Um, when he was younger, he was having lots of challenges in school, lots of behaviors, you know, destruction, mm -hmm. aggression. So data, right? They threw at us a spreadsheet that had all this data. Here's the types of behaviors. Here's when it's happening here. Like it continued to escalate. You know, we need to you know, kick him out and send him to a, you know, a special school. And my wife and I, the school didn't know what I did at the time. But, okay, well, the data says that. The data's not wrong. It, it's saying behaviors are escalating. But me trying to make better decisions and challenge things, my question was, why is it happening? There's got to be a reason. It's not just, you know, random chance. So looking deeper at the data, I had this big smile. And they're probably like, why are you laughing? This isn't a laughing matter, Kevin. And I turned to my wife and I, I just chuckled. Um, long story short, every time he had a behavior, they were sending him to the principal's office. And their assumption was kids don't like going to the principal's office. So they, they had spent all this time building this data spreadsheet, coming up with these decisions. And then I, I'm chuckling because I'm like, you obviously don't know my son. That's why different perspectives are better. He loves adult time. So I, I went out to validate it. I go home, I'm like, hey, how was school? And he's like, it's great. I kicked the teacher. They sent me to the principal for an hour. She read two books to me. I think I'm going to punch her tomorrow. And if that doesn't highlight why assumptions need to be challenged, because they did everything right from a data perspective. Right. They had all the charts. They had everything. What they didn't stop and say is, is there ever a scenario where kids don't like, where going to the principal is a reward, not a punishment? Right, right. And you got to challenge cultural assumptions. Exactly. And it's just, it, it's not part of our DNA to do that. So we tend to just sit there and say, let's focus on the data. The data says behaviors are escalating. The data says COVID is rising. The data says climate is rising. And we never stop and challenge what are they showing? Why is it happening? And what part of my mental model is, is maybe incorrect in, in my assumptions there? Right, right. Because we can look at data and we are inherently biased individuals. So the person interpreting the data is driving how that data is being interpreted. And you're absolutely, absolutely correct. That's that's a fascinating story. And so, one, it's pretty funny. And two, <laughs> I'm glad you found the reason. But you're inside with being smart. It's like, I like spending time in the principal's office. All I have to do is throw a tantrum tantrum. And I go to the principal. I get to... I get to have a book read. I get to have adult time. It's fantastic. It works like a charm. Let's keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's the thing, you know. But from our perspective, we're assuming that he's connecting with the principal's office being a punishment. And that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. So it's a completely different mental model. Um, yeah. And in challenging ourselves in our own fundamental perspective in a situation is so incredibly important. Um, that's where real aha moments come in. I can tell, yeah. I can share with you that from a coaching perspective, 
that's certainly where the deepest transformations happens when we're challenging that fundamental mindset, the fundamental belief structure that's ingrained in us. We don't even question it's a part of almost like a part of who we are. Being able to see that is one of the powers of coaching because sometimes you need somebody else's perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for those people who want to make better decisions with data, you know, we talked a little bit about removing, you know, cognitive bias, cognitive drift. Any other insights, Kevin, that you have to share with folks to help them make better decisions with data without getting burned out? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is is you need to challenge what you see. Healthy, be, be skeptical, healthily skeptical, if that's a word. Um, mm. Because you said earlier, right, there's so much data. There are people out there that, that share facts and figures that are not accurate. And sometimes they do it deliberately, sometimes they don't do it deliberately, but it's really easy. Like when you read a book and you think of reading comprehension, the authors are trying to give you the whole story, but they don't write the whole story. They write enough where you can connect the context. And when we have good reading comprehension, we usually understand the context of why. But now when you see data, not only do they not give you the context, but a lot of times you don't even have the story. You just have the visualization. You have the title. And it's on us to challenge it. So, you know, I saw a trusted news source, right, BBC, when when COVID came out and the pandemic started, they had a chart on, on their um, website that talked about coronavirus cases, and it showed how they're exponentially growing. And everyone's freaking out. Rightfully, they, they should. It's a pandemic. But the, the, the moral of the story, the takeaway was, I looked at it and knowing what I do and training on it, I said, okay, well, how are they defining cases? And long story short, it was based off of people that they were testing. Now, hindsight, right? We know more about COVID now than we did before, but in the beginning, they were only testing for, you know, first responders or the elderly or people that had symptoms. We know that others aren't. So when the exponential curve went up, my other question was what else could have changed it? Long story short, they changed the testing procedure right before that. So now they were testing everyone and it skyrocketed. That chart in reality, all it showed me is we're testing more people. But what it looked like it was showing was, oh my God, the disease is spreading. It's more prevalent. Don't leave your house. Completely different. But most people are not accustomed to challenging it. It's right. Partly because they feel like awkward, like it's data to it. But we're not asking you to do anything with data science. We're just asking you to say, okay, what do the nouns mean? How did they define it? Where is it coming from? What's the time period? Very questions that you would have asked without even thinking as a kid. Am I there yet? Where are we going? I'm just saying, use your, your inner two-year-old and ask all these questions. You're going to find better decisions in that just from asking questions. Mm -hmm. Right, right. In areas that concern you, I mean, some people would listen to that and go, well, they should just tell us. Well, that's not how it works. Um, even if you read a white paper or article, for example, and uh, let me be clear the difference between a white paper and an article. White paper is typically research-based. An article is not. <laughs> so even, you know, anyone, including myself, if you go to publish an article or go to cite resources, are we going to talk about the entire resource, the entire research paper that we're citing? Probably not. And in fact, in some instances, I've, because who I am, I followed the breadcrumb trail. Okay. They cited this article, which then cited a white paper. What well, was the research about? And nothing to do with the article at all. I mean, <laughs> it's just yeah. like, but most people won't take the time to do that. And, and rightly so, they should feel a little frustrated that, well, I shouldn't have to. I get it. And, you know, being healthily skeptical is like, okay, I'm reading this. It's got some very interesting facts. How does it impact me? Do I need to use this information to advance my life, make a decision, whatever? Is this something that involves me or am I just, do I have just brain candy? Right? Absolutely. And, then, and that can inform where you spend your energy and where you don't. I like to use the phrase, that seems that way. It certainly appears so. I'm not committing to, yes, that's it. That's the thing. It appears that way, which means I'm not necessarily saying it's false or that it's true. 
Absolutely. I, I think you have a great point there. And what I bring it back to is uh, you might have the same data. You might even have the same question, but to your point of like, why didn't they just tell me the answer? Everyone has their own personal, you know, what does it mean to me? What's my risk protocol? What do I want to do with this? And just mm -hmm. going back to the COVID example, like if my risk profile is I want to see if I can go on vacation and I have people who are um, prone to diseases and elderly, that's going to be different than someone who's single who doesn't have any of those. Same data, but my answer of would I go is going to be different than someone else. Similar to anything you see, what is relevant to you, that filtering process is why I think the decision making is so personal. It's not like a machine, machine language, artificial intelligence, take over the world. No, because it, you map it to what it means to you. And what it means to right. me is different than what it means to you is different than everyone else. Right, right. And, you know, taking this into the corporate world, a lot of people get frustrated because leaders, you know, executive, high level leaders aren't making decisions that have anything to do with actually what actually is going on. Well, let's talk about fear and data. <laughs> <laughs> and how that data is being presented and most importantly what are they expecting to see all drives how the data is filtered as it goes up right absolutely because unfortunately right or wrong you know a lot of our corporate structures are fear-based not psychologically safe to share well okay and my group my, my, our numbers are here let me see how i can present the data to make it not look so bad so by the time it gets to the people who are making big decisions, that data may not necessarily be accurate. Usually it's not by that point, absolutely. Right, right. And I don't think people understand that. Most importantly, I don't think executive leaders understand that. And the value of stepping down off the columns, off the high horse, out of the clouds, and getting into and creating psychological safety within the organizations. Because when you do create psychological safety where people can share something that's a little less biased, something that's a little less tailored to their audience and feel safe to do so, that's when you make better decisions. Absolutely. It's also when you trust your culture more. Like mm -hmm. if someone is telling me not always the sun is shining and rosy out, I, as long as they tell me, it, you know, we're missing these numbers, but here's what we learned from and here's what we're going to do with it. it. It engages trust in the whole organization that, hey, we know what we're doing. We're going to drive forward and, and they start listening more. But if, if I see every chart like, hey, all the stoplights are green, we're doing great. And then, you know, we go bankrupt next week. You just you don't get any trust at an organization. About that. It frustrates the heck out of me because we're we're so fearful of losing our jobs that we're not given the runway. We humans in general to to be authentic and to be honest and, and use it as a learning opportunity, right? I, I'm a huge fan in teaching, but I don't grade most of my quizzes because I want to actually see where they messed up potentially and mm -hmm. use it as a learning opportunity. We don't get that as much in work, unfortunately. Yeah, we really don't. Now, hopefully as the workplace starts to evolve, we'll start to have more honest conversations and more communication in general, because one of the things we've learned out of being in a more virtual environment is more communication is better um, and necessary just because one isn't in necessarily the 360 in-person environment. There's a whole host of things that are missing in communication in general. And to be honest with you, pre-COVID, even though we were in person, we still weren't giving all the information. So let's leverage this opportunity as we evolve the workplace of the future to do a better job of being more clear about priorities and communication and how we're going to use data and creating psychological safety. Well, before we wrap up the show, Kevin, is there any other thing you'd like to share with our followers, either people tuning in now or later um, to the show that would help them make better decisions and avoid information overload as we work through these very interesting times? I would just reiterate that, you know, when at first when we say data, don't be scared. You don't need a math degree. You don't need to be a statistician. Data can be numbers. It can be facts and figures. It can also be you know, reviews on Amazon for, you know, is this, should I buy this coffee pot or reviews on a Netflix show? Should I watch this movie? That's, that's data. And I'm a huge believer of don't ever look at data if you don't know why you're looking at it. 
Um, and I'll give you a, a quick personal example to end with is, is I have all these Fitbits, I have data all over the place. And I'm looking at all this data and, and I'm like, okay, oh, my weight's down two pounds this week or my weight's up three pounds this week or, oh, I, I ran you know 10% less. And I just had this moment where I'm like, who cares? Like, what is, do I want? And I, and I found this one measure because my goal is, is you know, I have family of heart disease and heart risk. I don't want to have heart risk. So I found this number called a PI, personal activity instrument, that takes all of this data and puts it in one metric for me. And as long as that number is over 100 on average for the week, I'm good. So now I took 20 different data sets. I'm down to one. I know my goal. I look at it. If I'm under, I know I got to go walk, do something, do some jumping jacks. I'm over it. I don't worry about it. Instantly, I'm making better decisions because I'm not micromanaging mm -hmm. data that isn't leading to my outcome. I'm not getting on the scale every day. I'm not micromanaging, oh, I can't have this dessert today, even though I had a tough day. Like, as long as I keep that number in check, uh, I'm feeling confident about myself. And I obviously use it and work with the doctor and adjust as needed. So big takeaway is start on the outcome. What do you want? If the data is not relevant to it, don't pay attention. Just mm -hmm. instantly filter all that stuff out and then you'll focus. And I think there's some people listening who probably think, you know, that that's voodoo, that's magic, doesn't make sense. I always end with a, I have a blue shirt on today, but assume I had a pink shirt on today as I tell everyone, okay, 95% of you, you're going to go out the rest of this week and you're going to notice more men wearing pink shirts. You're not actually noticing more people wearing pink shirts. It's that I told your brain that it was relevant and you're watching, your brain's watching for it. Just like if you're going to go out and buy a white SUV, you're going to see more of them. You're not actually going to see more of them. So whatever you tell the brain is relevant, it's going to focus on. If you don't tell it what's relevant, it's going to look at everything and try to make that decision itself, which is very overwhelming. So start with the outcome. Start with the goal. Yeah, that's the importance of prioritization. Giving your yeah. brain something to focus on that's important. It's really interesting when you talk about you know positive psychology and mindfulness and that sort of thing. One of the things you're doing through a lot of these practices is you're helping your brain focus on something that's going to boost you versus take you down. So that's one reason a negative mindset so destructive because it's not that there's more bad things out there than there was last week. It's just simply that that's what you're focused on. Same yeah. thing with the great you know, mindset. You'll okay, get more positive mindset, you're, you know, more growth mindset, you know, that sort of thing. Well, it's not that there was more great things than there was last week. It's just that's what you see. It's, your brain's a highly advanced filter. It's an amazing tool. And what it chooses to filter is totally based on what you decide to tell it to filter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It also sounds like you're being able to leverage some technology to help with your psychology. Is there any other tools that you want to share, Kevin, before we wrap up the show that help people that are tuning in either now or later? I, well, I think just going back to the soft skills, right? If there's one takeaway besides filtering and prioritizing, um, we talked a lot about having that healthy mindset, having that healthy you know, brain that doesn't get overwhelmed. I think learning about emotional intelligence is probably one of the best takeaways that I ever learned because I, growing up, naively thought it was more about um, how I perceive other people versus how I perceive myself more inward. It's, it's both, right? And I never really learned that until I started taking some classes and how that helped me, to your point, prioritize what really matters to me and then filter out things that I were those negative mantras that were always in there. And it just, for me, it was life-saving. It was really helpful when I was learning a lot about my son. So, you know, filter to what's important to you, learning about emotional intelligence at a high level. I think those are two takeaways that I'd want everyone to listen and, and try to do. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today and how to avoid information overload, make better decisions uh, with data and know that you don't have to try to make sense out of everything um and and helping you know prioritize to help your brain help you and also rest because that's a big yes. part of resilience is you know taking care of yourself self as well well kevin is there anything else you'd like to say before we before we sign off for today nope uh just i have pleasure if anyone has any questions feel free to reach out um but happy to you know answer any after the fact but just appreciate the time talking to everyone Hopefully everyone got some value out of it.
Absolutely. I really did. And I know I did. Thank you so much again. And again, for those of you tuning in now or later, feel free to reach out to Kevin directly. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel or follow me on LinkedIn, of course. And you will always be notified, be the first one to be notified if you subscribe to YouTube of any upcoming shows and events. We'll be having a lot of those throughout the year. There's special events, panel events, etc. So my friends, it's been a pleasure, uh, whether you're watching now or later, and my deepest wish for you is to keep elevating. Until next time.